Hi, I'm Stephanie from pre raphaelite Sisterhood. In 1848, a group of seven young British artists formed the pre raphaelite Brotherhood. They had several aims, one of them being a strict adherence to truth in nature. When you look at a pre raphaelite work, you can pick any section of the painting and it's as detailed as any other. Foreground and background are given equal attention. They painted even the smallest details with precision, which was a radical change for the time. Their work was vivid and startling. They were a deliberate, bright splash of color in the somber-hued art world of the mid-19th century. So how do the pre raphaelites connect with what is now known as the first sensation novel? I'm glad you asked. The principles of pre raphaelite art were embraced only by the Brotherhood. There were several artists and writers connected to them that folded some of these ideas into their own works. One thing I adore about studying the pre raphaelites is that it's like pulling apart a fascinating web of Victorian popular culture, and you find all these great connections. It's a 19th century version of Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. This is Charles Austin Collins, a close friend to the pre raphaelites especially Millet. His painting Convent Thoughts is a gorgeous example of pre-Raphaelite ideals. It's painted with jewel-like, vibrant hues, and just look at the detail in her prayer book and the garden around her. Each flower is painted in the pre-Raphaelite style with faithful botanical precision. Now the nun pictured here is a woman in white, but as lovely as she is, she's not the woman in white we're interested in in this video. The artist's brother, Wilkie Collins, was a prolific writer. He had a close friendship with Charles Dickens, who became an important mentor to him. Their lives were not only intertwined by friendship and their shared profession. Wilkie's brother would later marry Dickens' daughter, Katie. When Wilkie Collins wrote The Woman in White in 1860, it was published in serial form in Charles Dickens' mag magazine titled All Year Round. It was a huge success. Riggers eagerly awaited new episodes of the tale. And excitement about the book spilled over even into the world of fashion, White cloaks and bonnets became a popular trend for the ladies, and there was even a woman in white perfume. It was written using multiple narrators. Collins explained his method in the preface to the 1860 book edition. An experiment is attempted in this novel, which has not, as far as I know, been hitherto tried in fiction. The story of the book is told throughout by the characters. They are all placed in different positions along the chain of events, and they all take the chain up in turn and carry it to the end. So if we compare this chain narration to the flowers painted by the Priapulites, each section of the tale is like a petal, intricately painted and important to the entire picture. The story begins with a startling encounter on a moonlit road. Walter Hartwright, a drawing master, encounters a woman walking along a dark road. In describing the moment he sees her, he says, in one moment, every drop of blood in my body was brought to a stop. There, as if it had that moment sprung out of the earth, stood the figure of a solitary woman, dressed from head to toe in white. He's awestruck and mesmerized and does his best to help her. Moments later, a policeman passes by and asks if he's seen the woman in white and informs Walter that she had just escaped from a lunatic asylum. Naturally, our hero was shaken by this strange adventure. The next day... He travels to Limeridge, a large ancestral home where he is to start his new position as a drawing instructor to sisters Laura Fairley and Marion Holcomb. In a perplexing twist of fate, he gets his second shock when he sees Laura Fairley is practically a double for the distraught woman he encountered the night before. There's a mysterious connection between the woman in white and Laura Fairley, and they, along with Walter and Marion Holcomb, are plunged into a perilous adventure. Now, this adventure also includes the abrasive Sir Percival Glyde and the deliciously evil Count Fosco. Now, Count Fosco is a fascinating character. He oozes a creepy charm, and he has a passion for animals. He loves the feel of white mice crawling on him, and those mice can often be found nesting under his collar. At its core, the woman in white exposes the limitations of married women and how completely they can be controlled and used. Men using their power to abuse women? It's a frequent theme in Collins' work, dating back to his first novel. He wrote strong, independent women, and he often subverted stereotypes. And not only did the woman in white shine a light on the mistreatment of women, it explored the mistreatment of women specifically in lunatic asylums. 
the issues raised, they may seem far away from our 21st century world, but these issues are as relevant today as ever. The woman in white paved the way for the modern psychological thriller. I also see some roots of Wilkie Collins' work in some of our most famous franchises. His villain, Count Fosco, with his love for pets, is a precursor to the Bond villain, Blofeld, stroking his white Persian cat. And who doesn't recognize this woman in white? Princess Leia has similarities to the heroine of Collins' tale in more ways than one. The woman in white makes a dramatic impression on Walter Hartwright with her sudden ghostly appearance. Leia captivates Luke Skywalker as an almost spectral hologram. In The Woman in White, a shocking revelation is made when we discover that someone is secretly someone's sister. And in Star Wars, well, you get the picture. Also like Star Wars, much is made of the symbolism of doubling and opposites in The Woman in White. Princess Leia is innocence and justice. Darth Vader is her polar opposite. Laura Fairley has her opposite in Count Fosco, but also in her sister Marion. Doubling, as used by Collins in his doppelganger aspects of the story, is often seen in the works of pre-Raphaelite artist Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Here's his painting, How They Met Themselves, painted in 1860, the same year The Woman in White was published. Here we see a couple meeting their doppelgangers while walking in a forest. Interestingly, Rossetti started this strange work, which he referred to as his bogey picture, while on his honeymoon with Elizabeth Siddle. There have been several adaptations of The Woman in White. A stage version was first performed in 1870. Silent film versions were made in 1912 and 1917. The Woman in White version filmed in 1948 made several changes, but it's fun to watch Sidney Greenstreet. You'll know him from the Maltese Falcon and Casablanca and he delivers a great version of Count Fosco. In 1982, the BBC produced a wonderful version that included Sir Ian Richardson as the hypochondriac, somewhat narcissistic, and nervy Uncle Frederick Fairley. Richardson played this character twice, reprising the role in 1997, and in that 1997 version, Simon Callow portrayed the evil Count Fosco, and he would go on to play him again in Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical version of The Woman in White. The 1997 version is a favorite of mine, as it incorporates Dante Gabriel Rossetti's work into the story. Not only is his work front and center in several scenes, but his marriage to Elizabeth Siddle and her death and later exhumation become something of a plot point. An interesting anecdote about the woman in white is about that initial scene where Walter Hartwright is stunned to encounter the woman in white on the moonlit road. And according to Wilkie Collins, that's the way he met his own love. The incident was recorded in the life and letters of Sir John Everett Millay. On a night when Millay Charles Austin Collins and Wilkie Collins were returning from a party. They happened upon a woman, all in white, beside the road. As the three friends walked along, chatting gaily together, they were suddenly arrested by a piercing scream coming from the garden of a villa close at hand. It was evidently the cry of a woman in distress, and while pausing to consider what they should do, the iron gate leading to the garden was dashed open and from it came the figure of a young and very beautiful woman dressed in the flowing white robes that shone in the moonlight. She seemed to float rather than to run in their direction, and on coming up to the three young men, she paused for a moment in an attitude of supplication and terror. Then, seeming to recollect herself, she suddenly moved on and vanished in the shadows cast upon the road. What a lovely woman was all that Malay could say. I can see who she is and what's the matter, said Wilkie Collins, as without another word, he dashed off after her. His two companions waited in vain for his return, and the next day, when they met again, he seemed indisposed to talk of his adventure. They gathered from him, however, that he had come upon with the lovely fugitive, and he had heard from her own lips the history of her life and the cause of her sudden flight. She was a young lady of good birth and position who had accidentally fallen into the hands of a man living in a villa in Regent's Park. There, for many months, he kept her prisoner under threats and mesmeric influence of so alarming a character that she dared not attempt to escape until, in sheer desperation, she fled from the brute. 
who with a poker in his hand threatened to dash her brains out. Her subsequent history, interesting as it is, is not for these pages. Colin's stories have a gothic ambiance to me, yet without the specters and phantoms. The terrors in woman, The Woman in White may at first seem supernatural and mysterious, but they're all too human. This is the world of villains and scoundrels. It's a perfect recipe of doppelgangers, swapped identities, false imprisonment, and lies. Wilkie Collins wrote close to 30 novels, but it's the woman in white that's mentioned on his gravestone in a fitting and well-deserved epitaph. Reading it is a gripping journey from the very first line. This is the story of what a woman's patience can endure and what a man's resolution can achieve. Wilkie Collins described that perfectly because as much as it is about evil, it's about patience, endurance, and resolution, as well as the belief that goodness will triumph over villains. Villains haven't changed much since the 1860s. We encounter narcissists and ne'er-do-wells in every walk of life. Literature and art give us a framework for dealing with them. Together, we can draw on that. Thanks for visiting The Woman in White with me. I'd love to connect with you, so subscribe, comment, or send me an email. See you next time. How's that? Yay!